What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster come and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Welcome to our guests right around the world. Thank you for joining us. Over a fifth of the world's 2,000 largest public companies have committed to meet net zero targets, fight climate change, and tackle the biodiversity crisis. There is agreement that to avert catastrophic impact of climate change, the world's greenhouse emissions will need to be halved by 2030, reach net zero by 2050 and be net negative thereafter. So how are we doing against uh, that benchmark? Well, forget about halving by 2030. At current trajectory, we'll be lucky to reduce emissions by half a percent compared to 2010 levels. We know that, you know that, I know that, but we seem to be acting as if we don't know that. Today's session is about bridging a gap. It's the gap between intentions and actions, the gap between what needs to be done to keep us within 1.5C versus what actions are being taken by players in both the public and private sectors. So the guiding question for this meeting today is, what does it take to establish credible climate plans? And what would it take to deliver immediate action on those plans. The session is structured into two parts, uh, a public on the record panel and a workshop section afterwards on the Chatham House rules. Uh, in, in, the, in, in that second section, there'll be three breakout work groups happening at the same time, but more on that a little bit later. First, let's get, let's get warmed up with a question uh, and a call on, on Slido, if we could have the link uh, to the Slido link, uh, Slido call, please. The link is on chat and it should take you to the Slido website, which will then allow you to answer the question. And the question is this, what is the single biggest action your organization can take this year to begin reducing emissions by 2030? Your organization this year action. 
The word cloud is beginning to appear. By renewables, renewables advocate support national laws. ESG tracking. Okay, I think we have a pretty good idea. Let's bring it to a close now. By renewables is the most immediate action that uh, most people here seem to be saying. There are others, procurement, supply chain requirements, internal carbon pricing, reset travel, deliver COP vision, data, solar panels, etc., etc. So let's come back to uh, to our session today. And um, before I bring in my distinguished panel, I'd like to welcome Jesper Broden, CEO of Inca Group of IKEA and co-chair of the Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders. Jesper will say a few words of welcome on behalf of the Alliance and share the experience of IKEA when it comes to, to climate actions. Jesper, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. And thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. I can, we can hear you. And in the spirit of companies learning from one another, what would be your words of advice for other captains of industry? For thank you so much. Accelerating climate action. Thank you, Lutfi. And thanks for calling us together on this important topic. Um, I believe um, we and uh, many of us on this call would agree that this is probably the most important decade in the history of humankind and that the climate crisis is probably the biggest challenge we ever faced uh, together. So we aim to be um, a leader uh, in the new climate smart economy. And the reason is because our customers and our co-workers expect us to lead, but it's also because climate smart is the new cost smart, which is something we need to uh, take to our heart and believe in. On top of that, um, listening to the film here in the introduction also, I think it reinforces the sense that this is our moral uh, responsibility to act. We simply cannot allow ourselves to pass this on to the next generation. Now, as much as I deeply uh, uh, am concerned about uh, the future, I have to also share uh, a bit of optimism. And if I, if I take the aspect of IKEA, which is only one of many companies who are on the progression now to find the path here, um, we have a, a climate positive goal by 2030, scope three. Um, and in spite of a lot of challenges that happens uh, uh, as we go by, the first years now, we actually managed to decouple growth from carbon in a way that we are up 14%, uh, 13.7 percent, in, in business growth but we are down by 14% in carbon in absolute, which tells me this is not an illusion, it's actually possible. And it's a good business idea. Secondly, I get a lot of hope from the uh, WEF CEO Climate Alliance, um, which I have the pleasure to co-show with Christian Mumentana from Swiss Re and a lot of brilliant uh, leaders. So I hope uh, several are on this call as well. Um, we are 120 plus uh, companies that together represent actually a big part of the global emissions. And these companies, they are uh, at different stages in the planning and in the execution, but all have committed and the intentions are uh, really to be a leader in resolving climate crisis, not only in words, but in actions. So now the theme today, which I love is how do we demystify net zero and how do we get to move ourselves from the why to the how? And I would like to bring two things to the conversation. Uh, and to start with, I think we should be uh, not only demystifying, but demythifying, if that is a word. Um, for instance, that sustainability should come at a higher cost, when actually it's the opposite. We see, uh, obviously, if sustainability should be a luxury for the few, we will probably never get there. And it's our job uh, as leaders to make it at a cost level that we can invite uh, the many people to be part of this journey. As a second uh, myth, I think, um, uh, is the classic discussion around the purpose and profit not going hand in hand, when it becomes, I think, day by day more obvious that the opposite would be very dangerous from leading a company. So finally, uh, let me share and let, let's get a bit practical. The things that we have picked up in IKEA uh, from other brilliant organizations over the last years, 
And if I put it uh, for the IKEA lovers out there as the assembly guide for IKEA here, how do we build ourselves to net zero? And yes, you, just like IKEA, you need to do it yourself. Um, it will involve some challenges, but in the end, it's going to be fantastic. Um, so six steps then uh, in that assembly guide. Um, number one is that we need to take the leap of faith and commit to Paris. Um, that's the uh, absolute starting point, and that includes full balance sheet and uh, disclosure. Secondly, uh, we need to get our CO2 footprint right in order to have the right type of actions down the road. So scope one, two, three, CO2 footprint is the second action. Third, and here's where it gets a bit technical, we need to get our goals right and use organizations like SPTI to help us uh, both with the credibility, but also the professionalism as we set those targets. Um, there is seldom a silver bullet when we put our actions in place, but more of a jigsaw puzzle. Four, um, we need to, I believe, uh, prioritize the actions that we can do before 2030. So it's great to have the net zero back at um, 2050, but what can we do to reach half by 2030? Needs to continue to be the target that we strive for. And on the fifth place, I would put collaborate and communicate. WFCO Climate Alliance is one, and, uh, and we uh, invite anybody who has an interest to join us in that. But we need simply to hook arms better than ever in order to resolve this crisis. And finally, let's uh, get ready to celebrate because we will uh, find solutions, we will resolve. And it's our duty also to share and bring hope to people by loudly communicating and celebrating the steps we take. So with these first words, I would like to hand back to you and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jesper, for the words and for the, the assembly guide. I think some of us uh, find them easier than others, but it's certainly a great way to. <laughs> if I may now go to our panel, and I'd like to start with Cynthia Cummins. Cynthia is Director of Private Sector Climate Mitigation at the World Resources Institute. Cynthia, welcome. Um, my leading question for you is, businesses and governments, as you know, are increasingly taking action in line with I think science-based targets that are, were basically initiatives that you co-founded. Uh, so what's your take? How can we get more credible plans and more accelerated action from here? Uh, hi everyone, it's great to be here. Um, so I'll, I'll just, I wanna focus on just what are the um, most important elements of a credible action plan. And of course that needs to start with the targets that a company sets because that sets the right level of ambition and clarifies the scope of action. Um, and near-term action obviously is the most important element to get companies immediately on the path to net zero. So setting a science-based target, which is a five to year, five to 10 year target into the future that is aligned with the ambition of the Paris Agreement uh, one point of 1.5 degrees is, is the most important step for a company to get um, to have a credible action plan. Um, the next thing is that companies should also be setting these longer term net zero targets. But I think the way that net zero targets should be defined is these are uh, near zero targets. Um, the way the science-based targets initiative defines net zero is that companies should decarbonize um, uh, in line with 1.5. And as they're getting, um, and uh, and when they reach this level of residual emissions where there's no uh, more emission reductions that can be achieved by 2050 or sooner, then they can balance those residual emissions with carbon removals. But all companies should be need to abate emissions by 90% or more, uh, depending on what sector you're in. For the power sector, for example, needs to fully decarbonize by 2040. Um, so the... The abatement portion of net zero is the most critical piece, um, and um, and just and there's very limited room for removals. And then the third element is investment to go for companies to go beyond their value chain and invest in the transition through financing nature-based solutions or financing the technologies that 
we need to uh, get the whole economy at net zero. Um, and the best practice in these investment targets is not yet defined, but um, I hope that will become a growing expectation that beyond uh, companies decarbonizing their whole value chains and achieving net zero, that they will also find, um, make further investments outside their value chain to support the transition to net zero. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia. I'll come back to you with a follow-on question. Let me move on now to Jennifer Morgan. Jennifer is Executive Director of Greenpeace International. Jennifer, welcome. And uh, my question to you is, which major levers do you see uh, need to be pulled to accelerate this transition in, with the pace that is required? And maybe just to to start for good good to be here with the panel and with you. I think I just want to step back and say I think on the whole, you know, goals and pledges and objectives are not them, themselves bad. Um, I think um, you know, in the case of of the Paris 1.5 goal, it sets the scale scale and the rate uh, at which emissions need to kind of go down to avoid the worst impacts, and we can also then hold players accountable to that don't meet that goal. Um, I think the the challenge that we have, and then you get to the levers, is when um, the goals get abused. Uh, and I think that is a key issue. When they're announced, but little to nothing is actually being done to meet them or to monitor progress. And that happens often when there's no accountability mechanism. So that would be one key thing that needs to come into the room. You know, the only thing that is there is kind of the political cost to resulting in shaming an actor for not meeting a goal. And I think we're in a situation now where that has allowed numerous actors to pledge a net zero target without doing much of, at all to, to reduce their emissions while getting kind of the public recognition for their green pledge or the green washing. Um, so, you know, the voluntary initiatives, one lever I think is to move away from voluntary initiatives more into mandatory. And I think when it comes to net zero overall, simple and transparent plans should be the order of the day um, with separate targets for dramatic reductions in emissions from the burning of fossil fuels and other industrial activities, land use impact, mainly from deforestation and via reduction of meat and dairy production, and then increased commitments and contributions to rights-based nature production and restoration. It's not about a mechanism that allows countries and companies to offset their emissions like the schemes that are being introduced on voluntary carbon market initiatives uh, from Mark Kearney and others, or an Article 6 mechanism under the Paris Agreement. But rather, it's around regulations with sanctions that lead to the decarbonization and renaturalization of our energy sector, our land use sector, and our financial sector. So it's really about government setting binding laws that hold companies accountable for their carbon emitting activities and companies actually calling for those laws to get those long, loud legal uh, laws in place and the accountability mechanisms. And then, you know, penalty systems for those that don't, um, maybe per, based on prohibition of the payment of external dividends um, wouldn't be included. Um, so I think that those are some of the levers that are there. I think it's really important that voluntary commitments aren't seen as you know, the answer because we've seen for decades that they haven't worked. So we need different levers right now. Thank you, Jennifer. So voluntary versus mandatory and uh, pledges versus accountability. Come back to you uh, in a moment. Let me move on now to Robert Cameron. Robert is Global Head Public Affairs at Nestle. Robert, welcome. And uh, what is your experience? in uh, defining climate plans and what sort of actions have you guys taken when it comes to the food value chain for example uh, thank you and uh, thanks again for the invitation it's good to join this panel and, and just to start by saying i, I would really like to echo uh, what's been said so far uh, particularly in terms of the scale of the threat that climate change poses it's uh, it, I, I think it's uh, it's, it's existential uh, and it's uh, urgent, and the time for action is now. I joined Nestle actually at a really interesting moment in time. It was February last year, and at that stage, the company had signed 
the UN Climate Pledge. Uh, that uh, our CEO had uh, made that commitment in September 2019. And having made that uh, pledge to be net zero by 2050, uh, we had two years, up to two years, to publish a detailed roadmap. Um, and in fact, actually, Mark Schneider, the chief executive, his point, uh, which I heard very loudly as I came into the company, was, look, climate won't wait. So why do we wait for the full two years to publish a detailed roadmap? And, and given the scale of the challenge, there was a full-on effort to publish a detailed, time-bound, fully-costed, net zero by 2050 roadmap and we published that roadmap in December of last year. It's crucial to say that in publishing that roadmap and laying out the pathway to 2050, that we take action now. And in order to be science-based targets approved, hitting that 50% by 2030 is crucial. And in order to achieve, if we don't do that, we won't get to net zero by 2050. You just leave yourself too much runway. And if we want to get to 50%, by 2030, then reducing by 20% by 2025 is crucial. This is like a marathon where we all know, once you start, if you don't keep up with the pacemakers, you're never gonna make it up at the back end. So we've gotta be really clear about that. And to Jennifer's point about unaccountable commitments that are made, one of my frustrations it has been this sort of gaming that some corporates have, have been engaged in where, you know, it's, um, well, we won't do 2050, we'll do 2045, or we'll do 2040, no, we'll do 2039. And then you look and discover that this is actually scopes one and two, ignoring emissions in scope three. This, for Nestle, scope three, which is, actually, is, is all of the uh, uh, emissions that lie in our supply chain and in the use of the product, so to speak, uh, that's where the bulk of our emissions lie. A huge percentage of our emissions lie in the agricultural supply chain. So that was a key focus. But thinking about it from the point of view of any, any of your listeners that are looking for uh, guidance on establishing the plan, let me just give you three key things that I observed uh, as we built that plan out. First, leadership. The chief executive was all in right from the start. As, he's, as, he, as he said many times before, if climate change won't wait, we won't wait, we act now. The other thing that he's also been uh, quite vocal about, uh, and it touches on this point that was mentioned earlier on around, is this a cost and, and, and how do you carry it? You know, one of the ways we look at this is that if you think of it in terms of an R&D investment, you know, you have to manage that out of, the, 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 of your, of your P&L. And it's an investment in the future that sees very little return today. That's one of the ways in which we think about our climate roadmap. It's, it's commensurate with an R&D spend that has returns down the line. If you don't do R&D, you, don't, you, don't get, you, you lose consumers. So that's the first thing, leadership. Second thing, you need, we, we've, we found it extremely valuable to have trusted external support. So, for example, the technical footprinting, we worked with an organization called South Pole on technical footprinting that gave us a really crisp and clear insight into all of the areas where our emissions lay. So we knew we were focused on the things that mattered most in terms of state taking steps right now. We worked with universities, including Cambridge. And one of the other key things was we have an advisory council, uh, an external advisory council. And when we took the putative plan to them, their view was, well, hang on a minute, it's just not ambitious enough. We, we think you need to stretch yourselves, go back, stretch yourselves still further. And that was actually very, very timely and, 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 and very valuable as well uh, in, in getting a kind of a trusted view of how the outside world might see that roadmap if we put it out there. And then the third thing is, so as well as the external support, we listened, we listened to key stakeholders. And it's really also important to have a conversation with investors. Once we found, once you start talking to investors about it, the appetite from the investment community has, is, is, is enormous. And, and we're under a lot of pressure, not just support, but also pressure from investors as they look to the future. We look to our employees and the hunger amongst our 290,000 employees to get across this and act on it is, is immense. Big, big, big point there. But other aspects that I think I should also mention, our customers, look at what some of the big retailers are doing. Look at Walmart, for instance, the Project Gigaton, uh, which takes climate change head on. You know, we're a key supplier to Walmart. We're, we're working with key customers. Then you look at consumers. And if there's one thing you need to do in a company like ours, it's stay in tune with young consumers. And again, the hunger, the appetite 
uh, for change. If we don't, if we don't get across this, we are going to be behind. And yet, as we sit here today, the World Benchmarking Alliance, for all the things we've done, the World Benchmarking Alliance published its assessment yesterday of the food companies, 250 top food companies. And if I remember correctly, it's only 25 or 26. I think it's 26 of the top 200, 250, 350 food companies actually have a Paris-aligned roadmap. And given the scale of the impact of the food system on climate change, the impact of agriculture, both on climate change and the extent to which it will be impacted by climate change, I find that astonishing. I really do. So it's time for the system, for the industry to step up and we'll do all we can to raise our voice uh, in helping anybody and everybody that wants support on creating such a roadmap or any advice or guidance. We're happy to have that conversation. There's so much more I could say, but um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now, Lutfi, and hand it back to you. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you to the rest of the panel. The one thing that seems to be coming out, um, you mentioned the word, Rob, uh, gaming. Um, Jennifer mentioned greenwashing. Uh, there was some undertone in what Cynthia said also to the extent uh, that there is a wriggle room in the way things are done right now. And I've seen this in other uh, meetings of this kind. A company comes up and says, we're doing it very well, but the others are not. Where do you stand on this mandatory versus voluntary approach? Should it still be voluntary, given that there is gaming going on, there is tokenism going on and greenwashing going on? Or does it really need to be, um, uh, you know, if it's voluntary, will your three-point assembly guide or just the six-point assembly guide, are those enough? Or does it need to be tougher? Uh, that is really a question that I would, actually, let me take that same question to everyone. Um, yes. Cynthia, what's your view on this, please? Voluntary programs can only get us part of the way. Um, regulations and other types of climate policies are essential. We need all um, approaches to solving the climate problem. Um, I do think voluntary, not vo uh, global, like and voluntary targets at a at a um, corporate level are very valuable for multinationals in particular, because regulations generally happen at a national or regional level. Um, and having a transparent global or corporate level target is still useful so you can get the big picture of how a company is performing on climate. So I still think that those types of targets have value. But also climate policy is going to be essential to get companies, to support companies to achieve their target. And companies have a really important role to play in advocating for the policies, various policies, policies that they're going to need to to get to achieve net zero. Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think certainly the voluntary schemes we've seen haven't really, I mean, maybe they haven't really worked, as I said. And I, you just need to look at deforestation rates and know that there was a pledge to get to zero deforestation by 2020 that, that hasn't been in place. And I think the key piece here is the urgency um, and the scale and pace of change that needs to occur. And I think that means that when you, you have some companies that are, that are doing good work, but you, when you have the, you know, the, the JBS uh, meat company that's saying we'll do 30% reductions by 2030 of just scope one and two, or when you have, you know, a shell that wants to become net zero, but expanding gas by 20% and doing it all by offsetting. And you have, a big focus on these voluntary carbon market offsetting schemes. I think there's um, a need uh, also from a consumer perspective um, to have clarity about what is real and what is not real. Um, because I think people who are trying to do something good and go and uh, enter in and, and lo are looking at companies, uh, but there's no, no oversight of that uh, from a consumer fraud perspective are, are very concerned. So, that means to me both na a set of national laws that um, put um, those types of pathways in place. And it also means, um, you know, an independent 
kind of uh, accountability mechanism if for if that is there. I don't think that any of the initiatives that are out there right now can do the verification because they're all either funded by companies or corporate associations, many of them, um, or they work very closely with them. So the independence of the verification uh, system is is very important as well. And I just finally, I think, you know, uh, just to bring people into the room a little bit, I think that um, people around the world are calling on governments to be setting these types of radical um, policies that get us to, to zero in and the next 10 years obviously is absolutely essential. So there's not a lot of, of patience uh, for the greenwashing uh, anymore. So I think the pressure will just build. And so there's a risk right. piece there for companies as well. You, you certainly make a good point uh, about bad apples contaminating the barrel for the good guys. And so why would they not want uh, clearer accountability mechanisms. I, I guess my following question is, are there unintended consequences? Do you think by trying to get the relatively harmonized regulations across borders and something like this, is that really practical in this time frame? Well, I think that there's, sorry, was that a follow-up to me? No, you go ahead, Jennifer, sorry. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Um, so I think, um, so I think that you know, there are short-term debates. There are debates happening right now on policies around the world. Let's look at the United States, for example, where, you know, let's see the companies out there supporting uh, moving down, you know, the bills that are on the floor, even though they're inadequate, they need that type of corporate support. Uh, let's look at what's happening across Europe. Let's look at what's happening in every major economy. So it's a mixture, I think, of those long, loud, uh, legal policy mechanisms that can then drive those signals. And then I think that um, within that, you have how corporates engage in that. Uh, those can happen right away while we're looking maybe more at the accountability mechanisms. Rob, over to you. Yeah, I think um, I, I agree with what was said about uh, uh, regulation. We, we, we would welcome it. I mean, we, we would welcome it. And I think that uh, uh, member states, you know, have a duty to step up when it comes to COP26. But, you know, all of the evidence that we have seen in, in the past uh, has been that, you know, member states are not stepping up and they're not coming up with uh, uh, nationally determined contributions that are commensurate with the scale of the problem that we face. So in the meantime, we can admire the problem or we can get on with it oh, and indeed invent our own accountability mechanisms. So what we did uh, alongside uh, uh, one or two other corporates, um, we've put our climate roadmap to our shareholders. The board has accepted it and, and, and voted on it. The shareholders have voted on it. And that's an accountability mechanism that we've created for ourselves. And we've built accountability mechanisms inside the company in terms of uh, executives and what they're targeted on. So we've linked it internally, as well as creating mechanisms externally. We're fully supportive of mechanisms such as TCFD, for instance, uh, as a reporting mechanism. Um, so you know, we're, we're very, very happy with the idea uh, that toes should be held to the fire on uh, on on climate performance, and uh, we would we would we would welcome strengthening of regulation, and we would welcome high bar uh, NDCs from member states uh, come Glasgow in uh, in about uh, six weeks' time. Thank you very much. And with that, we've come to nearly the end of this public part of the session. Um, Jester, I wasn't expecting to, uh, you to, to stick around, but you are here. Is there anything that you'd like to add to the discussion so far? I think it's a very good discussion. I think it gives me also, we are talking about the same things here. Maybe what I would add, I think as much as we need to drive um, uh, policies in and, and uh, ask for that from uh, fellow uh, friends, politicians, uh, I believe uh, the aspect of incentivizing change will be even faster and more important. So first mover uh, topics, but also creating uh, incitements uh, for companies to do investments earlier in any way we can, I think will also be part of the, uh, the battery of actions that we would welcome. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll bring the public part of this um, panel to a close. And uh, we will go into the, the breakout sessions shortly. Uh, but to those of you joining us uh, uh, from various parts of the world, thank you for joining us and see you next time.